I've got some OC for ya. All true, and what I have written word for word is exactly that. Ahem. A few years back when my parents had left the military, my father had trouble looking for work. We eventually moved into a lodge that my grandparents managed in the Northwest, in order to make things work. As it turns out, the month we move in, a job opportunity for my father in large house right near my school, mind you, the drive to my school from the lodge was 45 minutes, and becoming a strain on funds, became available. A few months passed, and the only thing we really had complaints about with the home was the windows. At all times in this house was it freezing, and the power bill to crank the heat high enough to keep us warm was ridiculous. So, naturally, we began bundling up with extra blankets at night, and staying together in the same room during dinner, with TV, etc. A note from here, at this time, we had two dogs. A hunting hound for my father, and a dachshund for me. The hound was nice, but more of a tool, while the dachshund was the family pet. Every night this little wiener dog would hop up on my lap, do a few circles, then sleep between my ankles using either foot as a headrest. I loved the little guy. One day towards the end of our stay in the home, we noticed some odd things. The most prominent of which, was that during dinner, my father mentioned loving how the dachshund kept his feet warm some nights, that night in particular. I responded that I loved that as well, but he must have been mistaken. I had kept my door closed after my dog came into my room, and my parents did as well. We passed it off as, one of us, was mistaken. The same night, I left the door open, as the dog had gone up to my parents' bedroom, and I hoped they would open it by going to the bathroom or otherwise, and that he would return to me. Around 2.20ish that morning I heard the little chatter of dog's nails on the tile in the hallway, followed by the soft padding of feet on the shag carpeting, then felt the small dog hop onto the bed, and eventually come to a rest between my feet. I remember smiling, feeling his warmth, then going to sleep. The next morning, I woke for school, just before my father left for work, and noticed my dog was gone. A little confused, I asked my father about it, whom informed me that the dog had joined him that night. We exchanged odd looks, but again, played it off as misremembering. Before I left for school, I saw that the dog had been left out that night in the backyard. With this, I suspected something was horribly wrong. By this I mean, I was tearing with fear as to what was happening. I was certain I had felt the dog, as was my dad, and yet he had stayed outside that night. I told my mother, who, obviously, didn't believe me. Later, I brought it up with my father. I remember him honestly showing some concern over it, and offering a proposal. He said, look, we'll leave the dog in your room. Lock your door, and we'll see if something happens. That night, I did as he asked, and locked my door with the little dog in my room. We promptly fell asleep, and awoke the next morning with little issue. When I opened my door, I found my father in the living room talking on the phone to what sounded like our pastor from church. The day following the pastor's visit went uninterrupted, and it seemed that whatever was happening was pacified. No strange feelings, no sounds, no vanishing dogs. Everything seemed normal. At this point, my mother and I noticed that the house was getting colder, but I remember my father calling us vussies, and saying if I ever wanted to go hunting with him, I'd need to get a little more used to the cold. A week later, the dog things began happening again. We would hear the nails, then the footsteps, then feel the jump, and finally the dog resting. I became so scared that I started locking my door, which did nothing to stop the happenings. One night when I felt the dog jump into my lap, I flipped on my dresser light only to hear a door slam down the hall. I never did this again. We decided to take a vacation from the home, to get some perspective and release some tension. We went to visit family and snowboard for a while. When we got back, we found my little dachshund mutilated in the backyard. His chest had been covered in puncture wounds and his legs were broken. Mind you, he wasn't dead. We brought him to the vet and they were able to patch him up, but they needed to keep him for a couple weeks. The happenings occurred nightly, throughout this time. The day we brought him home, he seemed so happy, excited. We played with him and gave him table scraps, we were just happy he made it through whatever happened. 
That night we found the dog in the backyard again with the same wounds, only this time he didn't make it. He had bleed all over the yard and was laying out on a scrap of cardboard as if delivered to us. I kid you not, this was the most horrified and sad I had ever been. From here on, we didn't feel the dog on our lap, hear the chatter in the hall, nor that familiar shag carpet sound. Only silence. Believe it or not, this is where things get really weird. My brother, at this time, six, began talking to an imaginary friend in his room. He wouldn't talk to us about it, but we could hear him through the door. He would talk about extremely vulgar things, and we could hear my brother saying that the things were bad, and that he would go to hell for saying them. I quote this next part. Brother. So what do you like to do, anyway? Silence. Brother. You shouldn't say things like that. My mama says that Jesus doesn't like them. Silence. Brother, oh. Silence. Brother. Okay, I'll see you later then. At this point, we opened the door and found my brother staring into his opened closet. We asked him who he was talking to, and about what, but he only responded, my friend in the closet. He won't let me say anything else. We duct taped the closet shut. I don't know if I mentioned this, but most all of these happenings only happened at night either right before we went to bed, or around two-ish. We began sleeping in the living room together. My mom and dad on the couches, my brother and I in sleeping bags on the floor nearby. In the center of our room was a small kerosene furnace that kept us warm, as at this time, it had begun to get so cold, we couldn't keep warm with blankets alone. Things began happening separately to the family. My brother would wake up in his room, and we would find him in front of the closet with the duct tape peeled back or missing altogether. I would hear footsteps down the hallway towards the garage and hear an elderly male voice beckoning me. My mother would hear a young man's voice whispering my father's name at the her and my father's head of the couch, and my father would see figures in the shadows watching us. I would cry myself to sleep often, and as I type this my own fear is making my eyes water a bit. We had another pastor come in to bless our home, but once he stepped into the door, he looked at the stairs to the second floor, where my brother's room was, and said that it was evil, that we needed to leave as soon as humanly possible, and then he left. A few nights later, everything stopped. This moment of respite continued for almost a week, before I began experiencing it again. I began hearing a soft whisper from down the hallway. I didn't understand the voice, but a voice alone kept me from walking towards that end of the house until daybreak. Basically, our family would hole up in the living room from sunset to daybreak, where everything seemed normal. My parents began to think that the entire ordeal was over and thought it would be best if we all returned to our rooms and forget anything ever happened. I told them about the voice, and the idea immediately fell through. At night, I'd wake up, at what I assume was two-ish, since my clock was in my room, and I refused to go back and get it. It was about eight feet from the garage door where I heard the voices, to hear the voices again. They'd say things like, come closer, then laugh, mockingly, or, please come here. There's something I want to show you, then stifle a giggle. I remember one dream at this time where I had come face to face with a large horned shadow held out a blackened silhouette of my house to me, and when I touched it, I became so cold, frightened, and tormented that I woke up and literally pissed myself while screaming in pain. My family began looking for a new home. Finally, one afternoon the family was getting prepared for the night. Snacks near the furnace, blankets, and pillows ready, and the TV to keep our thoughts occupied, I got up to go to the bathroom. It was only around 4 in the afternoon, so we had at least a few hours of daylight left. As I walked to the bathroom, I heard the voice again, and it made me freeze. TM here, it whispered. It was in the same damn hall I was. I felt literally paralyzed. I heard footsteps from behind me and felt chilled as they passed, leading to the garage. Come on you little pussy, it whispered. I couldn't do anything, and for a moment I thought about simply screaming and collapsing, perhaps hoping it would take pity on a little crying boy. The voice laughed again. Suddenly with a feeling of overwhelming desperation, I ran to the garage and opened the door and leapt into the cold. There. I screamed out loud. All I heard was laughter. The kind of laughter where your sides hurt and you can't catch your breath. 
I felt horrified, humiliated, and alone. My parents, hearing the scream ran down the hall and found me crying in the garage. The voice began to turn gruff and elderly from here. I know I'm dragging on, so I'll finish up here soon. I recognized it as an old man, but now it didn't sound menacing. It sounded pleading. My brother said that he heard the voices too, but I didn't care. The begging and crying was starting to drive me insane. All it would say was, please. Help an old man, or I'm so sorry I couldn't handle it. That weekend my grandfather, still running the lodge, fell out of a tree while trimming branches away from the lodge sign and broke most of his ribs and his back. The chainsaw, my grandmother told me, landed just a foot or two away and that it was a miracle he didn't die. I was the first to bring up the similarity to our dog from just a few weeks ago, and how the situations were the same. We moved into a friend's home that night. Now, we live just a few miles away in our own home. Since that day we haven't had any strange incidents, but I still have nightmares, awful bouts with depression and dream of killing myself on common occasion. Sometimes I see a man killing my family while I sit on the floor in my sleeping bag, dumbfounded, next to the couches my parents slept on. Let me tell you this, please don't screw with crap wood like this. I give anything, anything not to have moved in that house. It's messed with my head so much, I can't begin to explain how I feel after another nightmare. Hope you had your fill slash x slash. I sure have. Great Scott. Scotland it is. Friend and his mate decide to head out to Lena Chan, to know if I spelled it right, for some hiking and general chilling. Raining like hell, but decide screw it, rain never hurt anyone. Get there about 2 or 3 in the afternoon, park, and set off down a trail. About 200 yards in decide to go off trail and go exploring forest. Rain coming down harder, but they've got raincoats so decide to keep on trucking. 45 minutes an hour in, start hearing movement following them, but just faintly because of the rain. They figure it might be another hiker or whatever passes for a ranger over there, so ignore it and keep going. Noises start getting closer, but sound as if whatever is making them is creeping slowly. A few chills, but still chalking it up to another person. They eventually reach a less dense part of the forest and stop to chill and take a breather, noises stop as well. Shrugging all around, more worried about the rain coming down than anything else. His mate says he has to go piss, walks a ways off. He's standing there waiting for a good 8 minutes before his friend walks up and stops a ways away from him. Figures he's just dicking with him, calls him over. Guy starts towards him, and he starts smelling an old copper smell, his description, but chalks it up to imagination. His mate finally makes it over and is just standing there and watching him. Asks if he's okay friend replies with a grunt. Figures he's just being silent for some reason, so he makes the suggestion of heading back. His friend nods in agreement, and they start back. Tries to make small talk on the hike, his friend only answers in one to two words, or just grunts. Well screw you two dick tickle pushes him, friend just kind of falls over all stiff like and looks at him. Usually when he would do that he'd barely move his friend, and he'd always push him back. Starts thinking something weird is going on. Start hiking a bit faster, his friend starts falling back. Figures screw it, he can find his own way if he gets lost. Pretty soon he loses sight of his mate and decides to hold up for a bit since he can't be that far behind. Waits first a minute, then five, then ten. Still no sign of his mate. Oh crap. JPG. Starts backtracking to the last place he saw him, finds his footprints, but none leading away, forward, or to the sides. My friend starts shitting his pants just a little, but toughs it out because it's his mate and he's getting worried. Start calling out his name hoping for an answer, but doesn't get a response. Next level brown pants begins as he starts jogging back towards the clearing. Gets closer, hears something booking it through the woods towards him. Stops and hides behind a tree to watch, sees his mate buck naked run out onto the path and look around scared as hell while calling my friend's name. Pokes head out, calls his mate, 
and starts getting cursed out as he walks over. Asks why in the actual hell he's in his birthday suit in the middle of a damned rainstorm. His mates retort, why the hell did you knock me out and take my damn clothes? Staring at each other, friend says he never did that, and if he did why didn't he have his clothes? Get into a heated argument until they both start hearing movement nearby, along with the copper smell. Rustling nearby, both of them look up in time to see his mate, fully clothed, walk out and simply look at the pair. The doppelmate then smiles, and something about it sets them off and they take off back towards the trail. Whole time they're running, they hear movement on either side of them. Have to take a few breathers in between running because fear and adrenaline can only carry you so far, noises get closer, along with voices. Finally make it back to their car, by this time it's dark out, so they flip on the lights as they're leaving. Lights catch a set of eyes a little higher off the ground than a human, makes them both have a brown pants moment as they drive off. Get back into the city and their place. Friend starts looking over his mate and notices scratch marks along his back, as well as bruising around his neck and shoulders. For a while afterwards his mate would wake up at night screaming for him to cut this cursed thing out of my skin. Ends up having to have mental help over it, freaks out every time that forest is mentioned around him. And that my slash ex slash brothers, is the Scotland story. As always, it has been my pleasure sharing with you all. Until tomorrow night. I need help slash x slash. Strange things happened today, and me and my friend are stuck in my car and we are hunted. I took photos and wanted to share them with you, but they are gone. Not really gone, it's just they became unrecognizable. I don't know, probably my phone's fault. Anyway, I'll tell you what happened so far. Be me, average neat and slash x slash file. Friend came home from Iraq. Called him and asked to come over to drink beer and play games. He arrived and brought a disc, both side pitch black. Said he gave money to an old blind beggar and he gave this to him in return. Beggar said it's a game disc and it will change his life. Your underscore naive underscore friend dot jpg. Whatever, try it out. Use virtual OS, so it won't brick my computer. CD has one file, titled game.exe. Open it. Nothing but black background and one line of white text. It just says the game. Well, that's it. Just before exiting, we hear scream from behind us. Look back with neck breaking speed. It was my little brother, six years old. Asked him what's the problem. He points to the screen and says, that man is creepy. Look back at screen, still see nothing. Military friend is confused too. Bro described that man is old with wrinkles and bleeding cuts. Has a grin and stands in an unnatural pose and he keeps his empty eyes on him. Little brother still creeped out, said it's talking to him. Said it says the game takes place in the forest 12 miles in the west. Check map, there really is a forest there. It's in Navajo territory though. Friend says check it out, might be some old treasure. Agree. A camping was due and this was the perfect opportunity with friend here. Just thinking about what to bring, when grandpa storms in, takes out the disc and breaks it. Don't go there Anon. Asked him why, but he just kept shaking his head. Whatever, senile old man, you made me even more interested. Should have listened to grandpa. Me and friend took guns, camping gear, and flashlights then got into car. Drive to the location little brother told us. Friend says let's explore the woods and find a place for the tent. Sun was still shining bright. You could see far enough even a few minutes in. We were about half an hour in, when suddenly fog rolls in from nowhere. Friend suddenly stops, I almost run into him. Do you hear it? What, I don't hear anything. That's it. Where did the birds and insects go? He was right, before the fog, we could hear the wildlife. But now total silence x slash skills kicked in tell him we have to go back he wants to go on says it's no big deal compared to iraq another half an hour later we got to a clearing might be the best place for camping a little exploring later find an abandoned house in the middle cool 
We don't have to use the tent. And the game may take place here. Whatever bro, but I think we shouldn't go in. He runs there and opens the door. Wait, look at that. Point to the window closest to the door. It has a red pentagram on it. Looking closer, every window had a red pentagram on it. See some big animal skulls by all corners. Red paint smells suspiciously like dried blood. Dude, it looks like some cold house. Nah, we have guns, let's go explore. He just walked in like that, not giving a crap. Not giving up this perfect opportunity, make like 30 pictures of the house with phone. After that, I go after friend. House is in bad shape. The few furniture it had thrown around to the sides, dirt, and dust everywhere. Friend is in the living room, looking at the floor. There is a giant red pentagram with human skulls on each point. In the middle there is a little round table with a cup, a knife, and a note. Walk there and read it. It says something about gaining the powers of darkness by doing a favor to Satan. It says he is thirsty, and will grant you powers in exchange for your blood. Finished reading it aloud, friend starts laughing. Says he doesn't fear Satan and wants to laugh in his face. Grab his arm to try to get him out. He instead pulls down his zipper, whip out his dick and piss in the cup. How to make a spell go wrong. Gif. Why are military personnel so freaking challenged? He just keeps laughing and walked out. Remain there and make a dozen pictures. Think you guys will love it. Looking closer, the paint, or blood looked fresh. One on the windows are old. Whatever is happening here is not for the first time. And probably not the last. Better not meet the ones preparing for next time. Go out when finished. Friend is nowhere. Start screaming his name, no answer. Screw that, go back to the car and wait there. He might be went back alone. Just a few steps in the forest, hear shuffling from behind. Turning around, see only trees in the fog. Damn house should be seen from here, but there are trees as far as I see. Rustling gets closer. I want to say I remained there thanks to pure valor, but I simply was frozen in fear. Friend steps out from the trees. Won't get closer, just stands there. Stare into each other's eyes for a minute. I know it's you, John. Stop playing around. His only response is a smile. Bastard can't keep up his act. Only the smile grew. I sensed something was off about him. The smile grew even larger. No human can smile like that. My slash x slash days taught me well. It was a goatman. Supposedly harmless, more like a prankster. It finally started to get closer, so I pulled out my gun. John, if it's really you, tell me what's my nickname, or I'll freaking shoot. He says nothing. Instead, started running towards me. Lucky me, I shoot before I crap. In the middle of his chest. Black liquid oozes out and he lets out an ear-piercing scream. Turned around and bolt out. Never look back, almost not even ahead. Just enough to look after my steps. After God knows how long, bump into something. Definitely not a tree. It's friend. I nearly shat myself. Anon, you okay? I heard a shot. Thank God, it's really him this time. The goatman or whatever didn't follow me either. Just get out of here, I'll tell you. I swore, I'll never go camping again. Soon, actually find the car. He was waiting for me here when he heard the shot. Fog is now everywhere, not just the forest. You couldn't even see the road, not even with the flashlights. Anon, the road is too dangerous by car. No freaking way I leave the car before getting home. Don't worry, I'm a great driver. Tries to drive by memory and feeling the road. It's surprisingly easy, even in the darkness and the fog. Got worse though, to the point we couldn't see the road, even with the reflectors on. Then suddenly, the road changes. Sure I didn't go off the road, it just changed. Feels like sand. Friend finally started to feel uneasy about the whole thing. Stop the engine. Don't really want to, but go out to investigate. Don't know how, but there's sand everywhere. According to map, there's no sand for a few hundred miles. 
Yet we are stuck in a desert. Can't even see the road we came from. Taking a few steps in the dark, hear something break under my foot. It's a bone. From the size, it could be human. There are more around the car. Contemplates searching for a way further than finally see something in the distance something pale in the darkness. It's pale, skinny, and looked all twisted. It's moving on all fours. If you played Earthbound, its head almost looks like Giga's, only white. Better not wait for it to get here, go back into car and lock the door. Tell friend to lock the back doors. Tell him what I saw. After a flash of fear, he actually gets determined. Then we fight, anonymous. Better than dying like a pussy, I guess. Pull out our guns and nod to each other. It's close, we can hear it. Only one thing to do. Open the door. Get on the floor. Everybody walk the dinosaur. Okay. Wow. I didn't know that skinwalkers or goatmen or whatever were a thing, allegedly a thing, so I always thought I was the only one who'd experienced something like this, like maybe it was a hallucination or something, but after reading some of these stories, I'm starting to think maybe there's something there. Here's what happened. Few years ago, living with parents. Step out for cigarette at about 2 a.m. Mom hated cigarettes, had to sneak out back by the woods. Smoking, notice my neighbor Sean down at the edge of the woods, looking at me. WTF. Wave at him, he just stands there. Suddenly it's hard to breathe, like the air is thick kind of humid, I guess, and it smells the way pennies taste. Kick myself for being a scaredy cat. Take a drag from cigarette, smoke gets in my eye, if this has happened to you, you know that it hurts like a bitch. I'm forced to close my eyes and rub them for a few seconds. Look up and Sean is closer to me, like he'd walked from the edge of the forest but now he's stopped and standing still again. What was he doing in the forest anyway WTF is going on? He waves, but it's like he's jerking his arm instead of moving it fluidly, like he's not sure what he's doing with it, what the hell what the hell. Put out cigarette without taking eyes off him, back into the door and go in. Shut the door, peek out window. He's staring right the hell at me, closer to the house, maybe 10 or 15 yards away. Lock door, sprint upstairs. Lock every door in the house, go to double check every door. Double checking basement door, He's standing right outside the window staring at me. His jaw is just kind of drooping. When I look at him he does the jerking wave again. Scream with the force of a thousand suns. Run upstairs, encounter stepdad, he's like WTF are you screaming for Anon? I tell him there's someone outside. He gets his gun and checks. No one there. Ask neighbor about it at dinner one day. He doesn't know what I'm talking about. Freaking skinwalkers. It's been 49 hours since my light went dead and left Maine in the dark. The 14 dots from my wristwatch can show nothing in this total vacuum of light. Nothing but count down the time to my ending. I busted the crystal so I could feel the hands. Gingerly running my finger lightly over the face. There is nothing but waiting. Every now and then I see a small dot of light the random wayward photon activating my retina, or a stray particle passing through the earth, nothing more. Just a split second of false hope followed by nothing but black. The darkness must be getting to me as I feel my mind slipping away from me. The only thing that keeps me partially sane is the torrent of sound made by water running beside me. It reminds me of a fan running in the quiet bright of outside night. The darkest room is as the surface of the sun compared to this place. To think I came here for fun. The lack of luminance is wrecking havoc on my mind. It swirls and spins in a vertigo of three days drunk. The walls spinning like the eye of a tornado if only I could see them. I vomit the water and lay down against the cool rock praying to every invisible deity for mercy. I retch and vomit again. Groaning against the earth, I think about committing self and and laugh when I realize I can't see to make it painless. The spinning slows to an out-of-control teacup ride and I drink some more water. The irony of being trapped here next to liquid life has not escaped. Me. 
Three weeks. That is the figure I read once that the average human can survive without food if they had a steady supply of water. Combined with the six power bars in my pack I could cling to life for a month. Maybe a month and a half. Six weeks of darkness, vertigo, vomiting, and water. The humorous part is it might be the best tasting water I have ever had. We found your son's body inside a small cave about 500 feet from the path ma'am, the park ranger explained into the phone connected to the weeping woman. As near as we can tell he was exploring a small cave when the ceiling caved in. He had some power bars and was next to a stream. Are you sure you want to know that? Okay, the preliminary report is saying he lived about three weeks. Death is listed as starvation in conjunction with exposure. No ma'am, he wouldn't have been able to dig himself out. There wouldn't have been any need to. Well ma'am, I mean your son was on the outside of the cave-in. Only about 10 feet inside the cave. Ma'am, I know you are distraught, but we must have not been around to hear him heard him cry for help. Well. The coroner believes a stone fell and struck your son in the head causing a minor subdural hematoma in the rear part of his head. No ma'am, he wasn't unconscious, it means that you son was rendered almost instantly blind. Oh, Julia said, sitting in her playpen. Dan could hear her sloshing her juice around in the sippy cup from across the room as she waved and attempted say hello. Hi, baby girl, he said, lounging in the recliner next to the fireplace and looking intently at his laptop. He gave a half-hearted wave back, still reading the news. As he switched between his multiple open windows, from a comic to stock listings to a news site, his daughter tossed the juice cup over the edge. He heard it hit the ground glanced up quickly, but decided to deal with the cup later. Then he heard the rattling, as she picked up one of her toys. Oh, she said again, her wave communicated to her father by way of rattling. Hi again, beautiful, he said, offering a half-hearted wave back in the general direction of the playpen. He couldn't remember being this tired since Julia had been born. Despite the loss of sleep, the general frantic energy his adorable ball of joy seemed to possess was contagious. With Lisa gone for the weekend, though, the girl was taking her toll on the young father. He'd spent that morning trying to teach her to play catch, her still developing arms reacting on a significant time delay from reality. Then they'd gone to the park for a picnic, after an hour and a half of preparation, only to have to rush back home when it started raining. Some ridiculous series of videos featuring badly computer-animated insects dancing to Mozart had dominated her afternoon, and by extension, his. Anytime he wasn't shaking his booty to Wolfgang's fat beats, Julia would start crying. She'd gone down for an hour-long nap around 4 p.m., but that seemed to supply her with more than enough energy to try talking for the next four hours. Now, at 9 p.m., Julia was up later than some teenagers. If Lisa were home, Dan knew the girl would already be sleeping soundly in her crib. But Dan took the electric razor approach to bedtime, once in a while, let the batteries run out completely. The only catch was, his batteries were running out, too. He hoped hers went first. He closed his eyes for a moment, and thought about calling Lisa. As the home's main breadwinner, she had her district meetings a couple times a year, but he knew that the events tended to be half vacation. He didn't want to bother her. He jerked his head back up. No. He was not going to pass out before his toddler. Maybe Julia could recharge his batteries a bit, though. Slamming his legs down to shut the recliner, and jumping to his feet, he turned on his play voice. Hey, there, girl. Wanna try? Oh. She cried, standing against the side of her playpen and gleefully waving her rattling. Psychedelic colored stuffed butterfly. He shut up and stared at her, his dumb happy dad look frozen on his face. She wasn't looking at him, and she wasn't waving at him. She was facing the hallway to his right, on her end of the room, that led to the bedroom, nursery, and bath. Um. Hey, there, he said. Over here. Hi, baby girl. She looked at him for just a moment, 
smiling the smile of someone who was already happy before you showed up. Then she turned her attention back down the hallway. Ew. She squealed, waving again. He frowned, glancing at the hall from where he stood, even though he couldn't see down it. Then, looking back at the rapt joy on the toddler's face, he stepped closer. Julia's attention down the hall seemed to fade as he got closer, and she plopped on her bottom and picked up a doll as he stood in front of the playpen and stared down the unlit, but obviously empty, hallway. As a childproofing measure, they always shut the three doors in the hallway, the nursery on the left, the bedroom on the right, and the bathroom at the end. They all looked to be quite closed. But Dan, who had always valued paranoia over false security, strode back to the mantel and grabbed the fire poker from its stand, then returned to the hallway. Holding the poker in his right hand like a truncheon more than a baseball bat, he didn't bother with stealth as he approached the nursery. He flung the door open, flipped on the light, and did a quick sweep of the room behind the door and in the closet. Leaving that door open, he went for the bathroom next. With slightly more hesitation, he opened that door and flipped on the light. The bathroom was small efficient, Lisa said, and the only possible hiding place was behind the shower curtain. Remembering a horror movie cliché so universal it was almost part of the human brainstem, he slowly stepped to the bath, held the poker with both hands, and hooked it around one side of the curtain. He forced it open. Nothing. He rolled his eyes as he stepped back out of the bathroom, leaving the door open and light on. Now, just one room left. Now that he was this close, he realized he'd been wrong. His bedroom door was definitely ajar, if only by a touch, just enough that it didn't latch. He didn't imagine he would have done this. He closed his eyes for a moment and took a deep breath. Then he opened them and lightly kicked the door open. His left hand gripped the poker while his right scrambled for the light switch. Finding it, he bathed the room in incandescent safety. There was nothing apparently out of place in the room, but he gaped at the opposite wall. The window was wide open. There was a moment of blind, frenzied, spiders crawling through the brain terror, and he held the poker up and spun around the room quickly, sure he'd missed something horrifying. Then, as he saw the damp floor and realized it hadn't been raining for hours, he remembered. He'd opened all the windows earlier to save on AC. When they came back from their aborted picnic, he'd shut them all due to the rain except this one. Julia had started crying for her movie just as he'd reached the hall, and before he'd gotten to his bedroom, he was out there turning on the classical music loving bugs and dancing with them. He quickly stepped onto the soggy carpet, went to the window and shut it, for all the good it did now. He needed to get some rags and towels. Leaving the third door open, he started back down the hallway, eyes locked on Julia playing in her pen. The next thing he knew, he was walking much more quickly down the hallway to Julia. Baby girl, what is that? He asked, unable to maintain a play voice this time. Julia was grinning, eyes wet and shining, clutching to her chest a teddy bear. She didn't seem to be bothered by the bear's missing button eye, or split leg seam, or its dampness, or the smell of years of mildew, mold, and rot. Dan thought his face was going to fall off and hit the floor. He barely mouthed a swear word, then out of some programmed parent response, didn't finish it. Come on baby girl. We're getting out of here, he said, scooping her up and being enveloped in the bear's stench. He wanted her to let go of it, but didn't have any intention of sparing the time to fight with her. He held her with one arm and fished in his pockets for his keys. They weren't there. His already fiery panic almost consumed him, before he remembered he'd left them on the bench by the front door. He made it to the door in three long strides, grabbing the keys and forcing his feet into some already tied shoes, not bothering to pull the backs out from under his heels. He threw open the door and slammed it behind him. He didn't even consider pausing momentarily to lock it behind him. As he approached his car, almost running, 
he hit the keyless entry button and heard the reassuring clunk. His head hit the roof as he slid into the driver's seat, Julia still over his shoulder. Screw the car seat just this once, he thought. Keys were slammed into the ignition, car whipped into the road in reverse, all thoughts of seat belts or possible destinations driven from his mind by the singular, overwhelming need to get as far from his house as possible. A block down the road, he exhaled for what seemed like the first time in ages. And he realized Julia was breathing steadily, her cheek rested on his shoulder, arm pressed against his, the hand still clutching her new toy. Despite everything, he laughed, one shrill, almost bark-like release of adrenaline. Her breathing changed immediately, of course, as she woke back up. He felt her shift her head, propping her chin up, her view now over his shoulder. A moment later, he felt her arm lift from his. In his peripheral vision, he could see the foul bear swinging wildly as Julia waved into the back seat. Oh, 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 she said. I have a story that I posted in a thread of my own, but the thread wasn't getting any traction, so I'll post here. This story was told to me by my grandfather. I can't tell you guys the exact year, but my grandfather implied that this story took place when he was a boy, so that would put this story in the late 40s or early 50s. My grandfather was born and lived in the rural parts of the Deep South. His great uncle lived down the road from him. Back in these days, the family kind of lived all in the same general area and knew each other's business, and was involved in each other's work. At this time, my family were farmers and moonshiners. As such, they owned the only car in the area. And when I say they owned, I mean as a collective. All of the extended family, brothers and uncles, etc., used that car. My grandfather and his extended family lived on a road that they owned basically both sides of the road for what seemed like a couple miles. Meaning that my grandfather and his family would live in one house, surrounded by their fields and woods, go in one eighth of a mile down the road, and my great great grandfather would live there surrounded by his property. Go another several hundred yards down the road and one of my grandfather's aunt and uncle would live there, etc. This would go on for a couple miles. I say all this to explain that their road was infrequently traveled by car, as my grandfather's family owned the only car in the area and his extended family was practically the only family down that road for miles. If there was nothing to do, either on the farm or in moonshining, my grandfather's great uncle would sometimes walk about 5 to 10-ish miles down the road to the nearest, busy, road for cars. He would just loiter around the intersection at the regional church and wait for cars to pass by, to talk to the people in the cars. At this time, you would maybe get a car an hour, on a busy day. On to the main story, one day, at dusk, my grandfather's great uncle had to use the bathroom. There was no indoor plumbing, so he had to go to the outhouse down by the edge of the woods. As he was making his way down the path, and since it was nearly dark out, he noticed a light traveling through the woods. He said that the light was moving towards him, kind of bobbing as it made its way through the woods. Though the motion of the light would have resembled a person walking through the woods holding a lantern, he knew that it wasn't the case. The light was blue, and it didn't light up the surrounding area, it was just a light unto itself. This strange sight scared him, so he froze in place, not too far from the outhouse at the edge of the woods, his eyes transfixed on the light. He said that the light came out into the open. The light, almost a foot in diameter, started to bob more violently. It almost resembling a bouncing ball, though not ever touching the ground, just a violent bobbing. He said that he knew, somehow, that he was going to die soon. He didn't know how or the day, but that he would die in the very near future. I don't know how he knew, just that it was a bad omen. He told his family of the light that he saw, and that it was a bad omen, foretelling his death. He also said that he was in fear for his soul, and that he was sure he would go to hell if he died. The very next Sunday, he went to the regional church, that I mentioned was about 5 to 10 miles from his house. He confessed his sins and was baptized that day. The Saturday after he was baptized, about a week and a half after the sighting of the light, he was walking home from the intersection. He had spent that Saturday, as he had many lazy Saturdays, hanging out at the intersection and talking to passers-by. Later that afternoon, he decided to return home. He was making his way down the winding road that my family lived on, 
and he was run over by a car, in a curve in the road. As nobody came to the door of any of his relatives, his killers were never caught. His body was found by my family when they went out searching for him, when when he didn't return home that evening. TLDR Grandfather's great uncle sees a blue light at the edge of a field, near dusk. Blue light is a bad omen. Grandfather's great uncle knows he will die soon. Goes to church to get right with God. Run over by a car, the very next Saturday. Spooky. I have a similar story that was told to me by an uncle of mine when we were visiting family in North Carolina. He's my dad's oldest brother. I was about 15 at the time and a complete fedora-tipping atheist douche. But I still thought it was interesting back then. Dad and uncle were hanging out talking about their childhood while I sat around reading, occasionally listening to them. Over a couple of hours, uncle got a bit drunk and said something like, Man, do you remember those fucking lights? It was very sudden, so I couldn't help but look up from my book and dad kinda glanced over at me and tried to wave it away. Then uncle pointed at me with his beer and said, You never told him? So the story as he told it was that he and my dad were hunting in the forest when they were teenagers. It was pretty early, and dark, especially under the trees. Suddenly they saw these three lights zip past them from behind, heading forward. They look at each other like, what the fuck is that, and watched as the balls stopped about 10 feet away from them. Then they started bouncing in the air like basketballs and both of them felt sick as fuck uncle had to help my dad walk home because he was almost passing out. When they both got back they told my grandpa and he got really quiet and took them to some dude they called the doctor, but who was just some dude who gave out teas and herbs and stuff. Dad was really fucking ill by that point and the doctor said, if you hadn't brought him in, he would have died in three days. He told them to light some candles or something and to say some weird prayers, and he said he'd take care of the rest. Anyway, after that dad was fine but uncle said the reason he brought it up was because one of the neighbor's kids had told his parents that he saw the same lights, but he never got sick so nobody thought anything of it. But just a few days. Before we showed up he was fucking struck by lightning kick. Fucking weird story. I've worked in mental health units as security before and while most aboriginals are statement I don't condone you hear occasional lucid threats or rambles. I remember one saying in a fit of rage they don't know what we got in the swamp, there's a lot of wetlands here, and another talking me in complete sobriety after a lengthy episodic burst of nonsense about his mob knowing the secret to the shark dream. This continent is ancient and I think these people despite being complete offensive statement went here have made contact with preternatural entities throughout time. A psych I know once went on a retreat by herself down south in ancient woodlands and heard beautiful singing but resisted the urge to follow it deeper into the woods. Turns out local lore of the area from her liaison with the boss and park ranger security say people have gone missing never to be found with reported similar phenomena. A boss pretty much said it's a good thing she didn't follow the singing sometimes I think they like beings made it to this land as well or animist nature spirits. I'm inclined to think similarly, Anon. There's a practice in aboriginal communities, at least before Europeans went over, where a boss had to sing to the land, otherwise the land would grow hostile. Every piece of land had its own song, and if you learned the song you had control over the land and the things that existed. These songs were passed on as inheritances. Similarly, Europeans who encountered a boss early on said that they were taught songs that allowed them to navigate certain regions without getting lost. When you take into account the Dreamtime creation story and compare it to the tradition of the Mexican novels, you'll see a striking similarity. These novels claim to be able to effect very specific changes in waking life through learning the appropriate dreams. Spooky stuff. I saw an Ansa Borrego ghost light a few months ago. It's not the spookiest of stories, but it's true. Hiking with friends to the Goat Canyon Trestle. The hike itself follows hundred-year-old railroad tracks down a gorge, leading from the mountains at the top to the desert floor below over about 20 miles. Lots of abandoned train cars, cool tunnels, and sketchy railroad trestles to cross. The hike is technically trespassing because some company claims that it's going to get the railroad running again. Nobody gives a shit because several companies have tried and all have failed thanks to inhospitable geology and weather. It's usually a pretty popular hike, but we went on a weekday so we were the only ones out there. 
First few miles are spent enjoying the scenery and getting enough courage to cross janky old trestles. Fuck around in some old double-decker train cars covered in surprisingly good graffiti. GTFO the train cars because the dust in there is pure nose fucking. Continue on, see no other people. Go through a few railroad tunnels. They're supported by huge redwood beams which make the tunnels smell comfy as shit. Have a pleasant walk through them by the light of a single good flashlight and two ones. Get to the longest tunnel on the line, research says about one half mile or so. It has big rusty gates at the entrance and a bunch of old railroad junk around, very horror movie looking in the right light. It was noon, so spook factor was low. Tunnel curves so you can't see the other end for the first bit. Walking along when we see a light appear down towards the other end of the tunnel, much like someone turning a flashlight on for a second, then off again figure it's another group of hikers, flash the bright light at them. No response, think whatever and keep walking. Light flashes again. We're getting closer to the end of the tunnel. There's light shining in at the end, but the flash came from a dark area. Don't see any people silhouetted against the light at the end of the tunnel may have just been nerves, but we felt like we were being watched start hallucinating voices almost at the edge of hearing, also likely nerves light flashes randomly one more time then stops. Pretty spooked, but we're relatively skeptical folks and continued all the way to the end of the tunnel not a soul in sight. The trail is bordered by a very steep cliff to the right and Carrizo Gorge to the left trail is visible for a long way ahead, it's extremely unlikely that there were other hikers that ran off try to explain the light as reflection and cannot find anything reflective anywhere. Remember stories of the Borrego ghost lights. A train conductor in 1977 saw a similar light flash on the tracks at night and ended up derailing a train. People have followed the lights into caves where they have seriously injured themselves. Get moderately spooked and continue on. No more lights, just a feeling of unease. Forget all that shit when we cross the 200 feet tall Goat Canyon trestle and about crap ourselves. See nobody else on the trip aside from a group of Boy Scouts starting to hike in to camp on our way out. Guess we believe in ghosts now. If you're ever in San Diego County and want a sweet and pretty easy hike with confirmed spook factor, check out the Goat Canyon trestle. Aside from having cool scenery and weird lights, you get to see a lot of cool engineering, neat abandoned train cars, loads of history, and the tallest curved wooden railroad trestle in the world, some sources claim is the tallest surviving wooden railroad trestle overall. Pick related is the big trestle itself. Chile. Atacama Desert working in copper mines. Live in San Pedro in the weekend and go to the small village the company, La Escondida, build for workers in the week. Pretty good life, 10 out of 10 tourists come sometimes, good food and I can travel to nearby tourists places on weekends. I'm in charge on monitoring some guys so they don't fuck things up, and if they fuck shit up I fix it. So, in Wednesday I got a call from the boss of my boss, he had a high rank in the company. Tells me to pick my things up and leave ASAP and tell the guys that I watch to do the same. Ask him if there was an accident a chemical spill or a gas leak. He tells me to get out, he will tell me later. Okay. Start calling each one and tell him what to do. They ask questions, I tell them that I don't know and probably the boss is giving us the week free. This one guy, Francisco, doesn't answer the phone. He is probably drunk or something. After one hour of trying to call him I decide to go there, Probably he is injured from the possible chemical spill or gas leak. Go to his house. No answer. Probably someone else called him and told him to leave. Call the boss of my boss. Tell him about Francisco. He doesn't care about him and yells at me for still being there. Okay I'll leave. Suddenly two soldiers start looking at my car. There is a military base close so they probably are helping evacuate people because the accident. They ask me what I'm doing here. Tell them about the whole situation and that I'm leaving now. They tell me I can't leave right now. Ask why. They don't say anything specific, just that I can't go there. What I'm supposed to do now. Keep asking questions about what should I do and why I can't leave. They detain me. Holy shit what dot exe. 
They put me on the military truck and start driving. Ask them where are they taking me. They say to a near police station. Okay, I'm not going to talk anymore because shit could go wrong if they get mad. 15 minutes. Here radio. Codename evacuate as soon as possible to base, the gringos are going to take care of it, sending them in the Puma, helicopter. Oh shit what, I start to panic thinking there was another coup or shit like that. They talk between them and I can't hear. They look at me. Oh fuck they are going to kill me. They get to a military checkpoint, one of the go down and enter some office. Now the soldier comes back with other soldier, probably an officer or something I don't know about military ranks. They ask me questions and if I saw something. He asks me if I saw something. Tell him about what happened before the soldiers came. He says okay, and asks again if I saw something weird. I tell him that I didn't see anything, almost chitting my pants. He tells me they were doing a drill for an earthquake. I don't believe him, when we do that they tell me first and I don't get detained by soldiers. He tells me I can't tell anyone what I saw. Tell him again I didn't saw anything weird. He looks at me and tells me I can't leave now because I assaulted a soldier. What? They put me in a small jail. Ah shit, they are going to kill me. Eventually get tired and sleep. Like 3 AM. Hear Chopper. People shouting. Freak out. Chopper takes off. Fall asleep. Wake up in the morning. They take me to a cop station in a city nearby, Kalama. The cop tells me that I was mistaken for a missing person. They let me go. Call the boss of my boss and tell him what happened. He doesn't say anything, it's all okay now. Couple weeks later I got sent to the capital to work at an office of a company. Never knew what happened there. That was in 2005. Um, well this scared me. Be security dude driving patrol route. Stop on route every night is this canyon area up above LA. First night solo patrol, canyon is new account. Have to go past Jurassic Park style gate. Past abandoned guard shack. Up into canyon in a fucking Prius. Come to tunnel. If you're wondering it looks exactly like the fabled bunny man tunnel. Off at me gif. Drive through tunnel. Gun drawn and sitting on seat next to me. Fog rolls in fuck. Shitty overused Prius straining dot fuck. Fog clears a bit ahead. In time for me to see deer. Dead deer fuck. Dead deer dragged into bushes. Bye. And I shit you not. Long skinny gray arm with no sleeve or anything. Drags dead deer by its leg into the bushes. Nope. Hit end of road. GPS in car pings to let me know I hit the route stop. Road dead ends into grove of trees. No building. No pipes. No nothing. Just paved road and then trees. Holy shit fuck balls fuck it and fucking so gonna this fucking shit wasn't fucking funny five goddamn fucking minutes ago and fucking jetain tholy fucking shit funny now. Ride breaks down the canyon. All lights on. Feeling a being watched. See bushes shake beside a turn like I just missed something. Get back to Jurassic Park gate and lock it. File report saying signs of trespassing cause nobody is gonna believe the truth. Never hit that spot again. The account closed with our company three months later. I never heard anyone else report anything weird. Come to find out none of the other guards went up the canyon. They'd all sit at the crossroad at the bottom and log vehicle difficulty or some other bullshit reason they couldn't make it up there and just made sure the gate was locked. I talked to a couple of them after I left the company about that spot and they said they were all fucking scared to go up. Hell no it wasn't a skinwalker. No noise. No smell. No tries to communicate. It looked like the rake's arm actually. I live in central Alaska, a small town surrounded by undeveloped wilderness for hundreds of miles in every direction. During the winter, we get very little light, even during the middle of the day. 
This happened last year, in early February. Me and my friend Scotty were out snow machining about three hours away from town. We were relaxing and having fun for a day, not hunting, or camping or traveling anywhere in particular. We had been out for a while, and it was cold and getting dark, so we started to head back. About 15 minutes in, my snow machine dies. No sputtering, no clunking, no outward signs before sudden engine failure. Scotty hears my engine die, stops, and comes back to help. We pop the hood and start looking around to see what the problem could be. As we do this, the sun sets and the darkness sets in. I pull out a flashlight so we can continue to examine the engine. Not out of fuel, oil is relatively fresh, no previous engine trouble earlier that day. We can't figure out what's wrong. I'm starting to get frustrated, it's cold, dark, and we're in the middle of the woods. We didn't bring much food beyond a few snacks, and we didn't bring a tent. We abandon my snowmobile, and attempt to two-man it back to town on the one remaining vehicle. No more than five minutes later, Scotty's snow machine dies under the same circumstances. While inspecting the second engine, I notice a pale light in the forest. It doesn't look like an electric light. It's not flickering like a flame. I point it out to Scotty, who looks, sees, and goes silent. It's too dark to see him clearly, but I could that he was holding his breath. After some time of mesmerized staring, we noticed the light was gone. It was as if it had faded so gradually we barely noticed it go. I tried to return Scotty's attention to the engine, but he seemed completely disinterested. He suggests we seek shelter in the trees around us. I agree. We stumble through thigh-deep snow to a cluster of nearby pines, illuminating our path with flashlights. Everything around me is pitch black. The only thing I can see is the empty branches of trees and plants that fall under the eye of my flashlight. I was already frustrated, but as we were slugging to the trees, I suddenly felt as if ice-cold water were being poured down my back. Within moments, a very loud beeping, like on those emergency alert broadcasts, began to come from what seemed like everywhere. I shouted in fear and instinctively collapsed into the snow. I waved my flashlight around everywhere, freaking the fuck out. The beeping wasn't stopping. My flashlight finally finds Scotty. He's standing still, about 30 feet away, just staring at me. His face is deathly pale. His flashlight had fallen into the snow next to him. In this moment, to my terrified mammalian brain, he looked like a dead body being suspended by invisible meat hooks. I shout his name but he doesn't move. He begins to open his mouth, trying to speak, but can't form words. Looking at him standing there like that was making me freak the fuck out even more. The beeping noise, which hadn't stopped, gets louder and more aggressive. It begins to sound more like a machinist's shop, like angry grinding and scraping of metal on metal. My muscles felt like they were on fire and would barely respond. I forced myself to turn away from Scotty. The strange light was behind me now, gently illuminating the snow. What happened next felt like slow motion. There was a shape in the sky, only a few feet above the surface of the snow. It was oblong, wider than it was tall, with no exterior lights or details. It seemed to give off a very pale glow. Whatever it was, it was large and completely silent. I recall being frozen in fear, completely paralyzed. My limbs felt like they were frozen tree stumps, immobile and unresponsive. The mechanized beeping noise rapidly became louder, overpoweringly loud. I tried to scream but heard nothing but the beeping, which had completely taken over my senses. I had tunnel vision, but could not look away from this shape, floating silently no more than 100 feet away from me. In the cold darkness, this thing had seized complete dominance over all my senses. My skin began to burn, and it felt like my bones were liquefying in my body. I heard Scotty shout as if from a great distance. I heard two gunshots, muffled and soft. I thought I had gone deaf. At this, the mechanized beeping stopped with a horrific abortive grunting noise, and the shape silently ascended. The moment it got above the tree lean, I couldn't see it anymore, even against a backdrop of stars. Scotty came up behind me, screaming hysterically, grabbing my jacket and pulling me along as he sprinted to the trees. We dove under the tree, kicking out a rudimentary snow shelter. Neither of us slept the entire night. 
We sat huddled in our hollow snow mound, underneath the pine trees until the sun rose late the next day. We followed our tracks back to Scotty's snow machine. It started on the first try. We drove back to where we had abandoned my snow machine. It too started on the first try. The ride back home went by in a daze. We never talked about it again.